So welcome everyone. We will wait some uh, minutes to let everyone get in, but um, I'm welcoming welcoming you in on behalf of the IDEM, the European Distance and E-Learning Network. And uh, shortly we will begin with the webinar. We are already 29 participants, so we are really excited. We are going to have a very interesting and exciting webinar today. We already see some people getting in. We are already more than 30 participants. Hello, Christina from Timisoara. Hello, Zoe, Hassan, Laura. It's a pleasure to meet you. I think since we have a very tight schedule, I think that we can already start. So welcome everyone. My name is Luis Villarejo and together with Gise Rangel de Lázaro, we will be your host uh, today for this very exciting webinar session. Today's webinar is titled, You Can Handle, You Can Teach It, Use of XR Technologies to Enhance Teaching and Learning Methods in Online Higher Education. As you may know, this webinar is part of this year's European Online and Distance Learning Week, probably organized by EDM, the European Distance and E-Learning Network, which is co-funded by the European Union Erasmus Plus project. Uh, we have an exciting program today, as I told you, consisting of two talks and a Q&A uh, session at the end of these two talks. You will be able to post your questions on the chat, and Gisette will be in charge of uh, uh, recruiting these uh, questions and then at the end of the two, two talks we will be able to to chat about them. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Gise. Gise is a postdoctoral fellow at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences at the University of at the Open University of Catalonia and uh, myself I will be uh, chairing the session. So good afternoon Gise. Can you say hi to the audience please? Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, Gise. Gise is an anthropologist focused on using digital imaging technologies such as 3D structure light scanner, computed tomography, micro CT, as well as 3D geometric morphometrics to study functional morphology in a broad comparative and phylogenetic framework. In 2012 and 2014, she received the Erasmus Mundus grant to complete the International Easter and the doctorate in prehistory and human evolution at the Rovira y Virgili University at Spain the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle and Sorbonne University at France. And as a part of her work, she integrates techniques and methods to, from bioarchaeology, bioanthropology, functional morphology, paleontology, and digital heritage, rendering her research particularly cross-disciplinary. Gise has also actively participated in bioarchaeological and bioanthropological studies and field campaigns. She takes an active role in promoting science in both academic and non-academic communities. And she is also actively involved in promoting career paths in STEAM. In 2013, she became an Erasmus Mundus program and re regional representative. And as a part of this international role, she organized and participated activities for the recruitment and orientation of new students. And regarding myself, my background is in computational science, especially in educational technology where I have developed my professional and research career. I am also co-founder and CEO of Immersion Studio, which is an, an spin-off of the Open University of Catalonia, where we develop uh, immersive learning experiences for educational institutions and companies using especially interactive uh, 360 video in order to enhance uh, retention and empathy 
across a wide different uh, of verticals. Um, we have in this time at the immersion studio we have had uh, the luck to work for clients like uh, United Nations or the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, where we have had the opportunity to train more than twenty thousand professionals with immersive experiences. So we are really thrilled about uh, the actual state of the art of XR in education. So before introducing uh, our speakers today, let me tell you about why this webinar and why now. Uh, as you know, over the past year, which uh, has been defined by the COVID-19 pandemic, we have witnessed the boom in the application of digital media to education. This has had a big impact in traditional teaching, teaching operations, uh, shifting to online delivery. Whether and how such activities will continue in a post-COVID-19 situation remain unclear. And apart from this, are the online and open university with a long last practice in providing flexible and innovative educational options, widening many learners' possibilities. In this webinar, our goal is to share the experience gain, good practice, and the pros and cons of handling with 3D technologies, augmented and virtual reality resources, to amplify a multimodal, active, and learner-centered method in online higher education during the COVID-19 pandemic. As an example of resilience in the educational context, exploring the use made of these digital tools will allow us to understand how the teaching and learning process has been strengthened and interactively expanded. Our first talk today will be learning in the metaverse and will be given by, by Professor Friedling Wild. Good afternoon, Fridolin. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Fridolin is full professor at the Institute of Educational Technology of the Open University, and he's also leader of, of the Performance Augmentation Lab at the United Kingdom. After Fridolin, we will have the opportunity to listen to Pierre Bourdin and his talk, XR for e-learning. Good afternoon, Pierre. Hello, good afternoon. Pierre is lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of Computer Science, Multimedia and Telecommunications at the Open University of Catalonia. As I told you before, during both presentations, you will be able to post questions and Gise will be collecting them. And at the end of the two uh, talks, we will be able to, to discuss about them. So let me briefly go with the first talk. I will uh, introduce our first speaker, Fridolin Wild and I will read uh, his short uh, biography. Fridolin seeks to close the dissociative gap between abstract knowledge and its practical application, researching radically new forms of linking directly from knowing something in principle to applying that knowledge in practice and speeding its refinement and integration into Polish performance. Fridolin, Fridolin led uh, the special interest group on wearable and ACE learning of the European Association of Technology and ACE Learning. He chairs the working group on augmented reality learning experience model of the, e, of the IEEE Standards Association, as well as the natural language processing task view of the comprehensive R archive network. He is convener of a key standards working group, WG11, for future proofing Augmented Reality Virtual Reality in a Joint Technical Committee of the International Standards Organization and International Electrotechnical Commission, part of the subcharter for computer graphics, image processing, and environmental data representation. He also co-chairs the, e, the IEEE iCycle SIG XR for learning and performance augmentation. Friedelin is a trust appointed governor of Oxford Inspires Academy. He's trusted reviewer for several funding bodies, including the EU and RCUK. Fridolin is and has been leading also numerous European projects like at the EU, European Space Agency, and nationally funded research project, including Arete, OpenReal, LAR, WebKit, TCBL, Tell Me, Tell Map and a long list of others. From 2015 to 2020, Friedelin was Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Brookes University. From 2009 to 2016, he was at the Knowledge Media Institute of the Open University at the UK. And Friedelin has also worked as a researcher at the Vienna University of Economics and Business in Austria from 2004 to 2009. 
He has also studied at the University of Regensburg in Germany with extramurals at the Ludwig, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and the University of Hildesheim. So it is a pleasure for me to give the floor to Professor Fridolin Wild. So Fridolin, please go ahead with your presentation. Good. Um, good afternoon, or um, if you watch this later as a recording, good morning, um, good evening, whichever time of the day it is when you watch this. My name is Friedland. I'm very pleased to be here and speak to you about um, the naughty things we have been doing in my lab um, over time, and um, in particular, the things related to what becomes a big thing now, the metaverse. I thought I organized my talk to you in the following four parts. So challenge, opportunity, what it actually is that we've been doing, and then <clears throat> the associated research findings. Of course, then I will finish off with a short summary of, of everything going on. So let's deep dive first into the challenge area. The challenge is not just there because of the pandemic, but the pandemic has accelerated a trend that was already happening. Um, the trend to remote work, to more e-commerce, to automation, <clears throat> and that disrupts significantly um, society, that disrupts in particular the way we work and the type of work we need. McKinsey, for example, estimates that up to 25% more workers than previously estimated now need to switch their occupation. It's the same as before, but accelerated, that we look at um, market winners, so of course healthcare, but classically um, STEM professionals, health professionals, management are the winners of this pandemic and the previous wave of automation. And there are also losers, and that is in particular in, in office support, warehousing, agriculture, food services, and so on. This is not just something that McKinsey confabulated. If you look at earlier studies, like the one from uh, Frey and Osborne, the colleagues down the road here in Oxford, um, they have found already in 2013 um, through a similar analysis that a major part of our societies and our jobs are being disrupted by automation. If you want to humor yourself, check out on Google um, BBC and uh, Will a Robot Take My Job? They have a fantastic database built on, on the work uh, of Ray and Osborne. Um, predicting whether the job um, we have, uh, the job of our friends and families and neighbors are actually safe. And surprisingly, there are not that many. This is uh, something governments have recognized for some time. Um, here in the UK, we see a shakeup of technical education, of technical further education, where new things are being introduced. T-levels, for example, as an alternative to A-levels. Um, a push towards apprenticeships, skills funds, uh, investment in further education colleges, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's happening and that's not just happening um, in, in our country here. That's happening across the globe um, with um, differences, of course, between the nations. But the run to technical education is a trend that certainly has been further accelerated. Some people take this far and say this is going to impact university education as we know it. And um, through the pandemic, in particular, the shortcomings in the current models we have in, in university education come to light and um, some of them will not survive this pandemic. Um, Scott Galloway, for example, predicts that the big elite universities, uh, the Ivy League, uh, the Russell universities will be the winners of um, the fallout of the pandemic, team up with big IT to significantly expand their enrollment and offer um, hybrid or online only even uh, degrees, um, maybe retaining the mixed experience with uh, the brick and mortar experience and, and networks in the university for uh, a select few, but overall seismically altering the landscape of higher education. It may even be that this does not require universities at all. So if we look around, if we look at uh, investments, um, if we look at uh, startups, we can see the market is shaken up. 
Um, Tony Blair's oldest son um, uh, diverted a little bit from the policies of what his father was uh, standing up for when in government and raised uh, money for a unicorn um, significantly called the multiverse, um, where without uh, university is um, alternatives to um, university education are being built. Google, IBM, all of them do have already offers in specific spaces like here, Grow It Stronger with Google um, or IBM Academy, where uh, specific professions, particularly in the IT field, of course, but um, increasingly in other areas too, are being um, catered for directly by big IT. And that's not surprising if we think about it. Um, these companies have business models that require constant growth, that require to make promises to shareholders come true. And um, markets are at some point in time full. The only opportunity to grow is to open up new markets or break into existing ones. So the push towards education and the push towards healthcare and digital healthcare is not surprising. The battle to control the metaverse has begun. That's the context, dark, but at the same time, I think we also have a great opportunity with um, particularly this black swan of the pandemic. And the opportunity is that through the pandemic, <clears throat> we have experienced a push towards distance education technologies. We uh, have um, informed um, predictions by Sir Michael Barber, for example, the, um, who co commissioned a study for the Office for Students, a regulator for higher education in the UK for all 400 further education colleges and universities of the UK, um, predicting that uh, the pandemic has changed our approach to learning uh, forever. And um, a disruptive avalanche has arrived, and we we should all work together to to use this as a as a as a slingshot, as a gravity assist, um, to roll out more educational technology across the board in all areas. And um, I'm very proud that I had an opportunity to to input here as well for the area of AR and VR. The report in particular says there is a huge potential to strengthen and expand, in particular technical education, skills-based learning and training, because it helps create an authentic experience um, in, in areas where we otherwise simply can't, um, where it's too dangerous, too expensive, um, access to tools or kit um, is limited. Um, that's uh, an area where we can expect um, these technologies to strive. They also have a potential to really change the approach we have um, to learning and teaching because it um, offers opportunities for different types of personalization as well as an unprecedented strong link between the theory and practice as I like to call it a strong link directly from the potential for pop performance for the potential for action for the competence to link with its performance and vice versa. And that I find uh, as a technology and as learning researcher, uh, particularly exciting. Yeah, um, if we don't want to leave the field um, to movements out there um, who are engaging in building the metaverse, who are engaging in building this next generation of personal computing, the future of work, the future of learning, then we need to um, get off the bench now and act and see how we can bring innovative new technologies to um, continue to be an important number in this field. The name is, there, there are plenty of names for the metaverse. Um, you may have heard it in different flavors, the mirror world, the augmented reality cloud, the magic verse, the spatial internet, the overlay, cyber physical systems, or then the classic notion of extended reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, twin world, all of them share in common that they start seeing personal computing more as a platform. They start seeing this movement of turning away from devices that mediate our access to the digital overlay and rather using unobtrusive wearable computing technologies. 
this example that you see here, that's um, a spatial map of my office um, using computer vision technology and um, LiDAR scan on an iPad here to figure out where are walls, where are platforms, um, is there a chair, maybe even mixing in some spatial understanding and um, using that then to anchor augmented content and deliver it to the user. If it's delivered on smart glasses, it even becomes a rather believable reality. Just to clarify this as well, what I'm talking about here on the, on the mixed reality spectrum is more on this end, the uh, end of um, augmenting the real environment with light touch, providing some overlays, but otherwise being in the real world, whereas here on the other end of the spectrum, um, and that's, I think, where Mark Zuckerberg um, gets it a little bit wrong, um, we look at uh, a fully immersive environment um, where the best use is in, in simulations where otherwise we can't or it's too dangerous, um, and certainly not to um, exploit people in due to poverty and precarious living conditions um, to give them a sort of matrix that keeps them happy. Yeah, but it is a spectrum. Often uh, the difference between the two is, is not black and white, and um, there are applications that can uh, even change over time, meandering between the extreme poles. So what have we been working on in this space of the metaverse, of the overlay reality? We have been working on rapid rescaling, particularly on my chair. Um, the last decade or so, we have um, pulled a lot of efforts um, across various uh, EU projects. At the moment, um, most notably AHET, uh, which is funded in the Interactive Technologies Call, where we investigate the use of augmented reality for education on uh, end of primary, beginning of secondary school level, um, but a, a wide range before. Our vision is that we create rapid reskilling, that we need to prepare for a future where the speed is of the essence, the speed of how quickly we learn something um, and that then defines whether a business is successful or not, whether um, a person is uh, more employable or less employable. And for us, we see augmented reality as a key ingredient in that, um, which has the potential that it enables us to go from unskilled to mastery in no time. I'm deliberately provocatively saying that on the job. Um, and I think that's, that's even more notable. Um, the, the separation between work and learning um, is artificial, doesn't need to be there. Um, we can enable people to be productive from the moment they engage in learning. We use wearable technologies, and I'd, I'd like to invite you also to take a look in, into our uh, overview chapter here uh, for wearable enhanced learning uh, from EHL's special interest group on, on wearable enhanced learning, where we um, provide an overview of the ages of technology enhanced learning that we're going through. We're certainly, in my point of view, in this phase where um, we will see a lot of new tech. Um, we already do see a lot of gadgets and uh, smart glasses are at the verge of lifting off with more than 50 producers worldwide. Ray-Ban recently uh, brought out a new set of smart glasses. Um, the big ones are jumping on it. It's a question of time till um, the market is big enough to be considered on par with mobile phones. Um, and that doesn't happen from today to tomorrow. But device penetration rates are increasing year after year. However, over in this space, I think a lot of innovation will happen that we will only see in a few years, where we see at the moment exciting research prototypes, such as, for example, around smart textiles. Textiles that, that can be fully, you, you can build a computer completely out of fabric um, using um, conductive threads to uh, build the equivalent of a PCB board using an embroidery machine. You can um, use stretchable uh, components or touch uh, components um, to embed interaction directly in the things you wear. And in that space, um, in particular, the applications in um, in uh, haptic feedback, uh, physical feedback are, are unprecedented 
um, in that space of guiding people really um, with movement uh, for sports, for rehabilitation, for exa games, um, will be truly exciting. The years to come will show. But let's stick with the smart glasses here for a second. If we look at reality as a platform, if we look at augmenting reality, how does that actually work? In my definition, this touches into four areas that we can manipulate and control. That's reality in itself. Augmenting reality can sometimes mean that we alter really the physical reality, that we design spaces in a way that they are more amenable for tracking, that they are more am amenable for projection or stabilization, that we avoid reflective surfaces and things like that, for example. Um, you find today um, manufacturers of helicopters, Swiss copter, um, who would design the frames of their helicopters in a way that they are more uh, amenable to tracking so that they can deliver board books, uh, maintenance instructions and the likes um, directly and better than if they hadn't altered reality. The more common place where we manipulate things, and that's where reality as a platform kicks in, is of course in the delivery system, where there are plenty projection, smart glasses, contact lenses, maybe in the more distant future, um, handheld devices, um, any Apple device from 2014, any Android device um, after 2016, um, well, not any, some of them don't have tilt sensors and stuff. Um, many of them are, uh, yeah, can use modern augmented reality technology and um, that is increasingly a market. But we have to keep in mind that here on the left side, we need to understand and uh, design uh, for perception and design for experience uh, so that we get stuff through our perceptive system of the human, which already does um, processing manipulation from the retina to the uh, ganglions, to the visual cortex, and from there then weaving it together with other thoughts and fantasies and experience. When we augment reality, we talk about looking at all these four stages, manipulating reality, manipulating uh, the pretend reality, uh, the augmented reality in the delivery system, but also doing it um, in a human understandable way with perceptive perception design and a good learning experience. There are many tools. Years ago, one would have said, if you want to engage in this space, you have to build an app. You have to hire a developer and a designer, and you build an augmented reality app. And that's, I think, what is now changing with um, the metaverse clearly coming. We treat reality as a platform, which allows us to um, allow people with less specialist skills to already create and design that reality using editors, using authoring tools. There are many. Here I selected just a few, um, like uh, Reflect, uh, very strong standing in the automotive sector, for example, um, in, in training. Adobe, fantastic tool, Adobe Aero. Um, Eon Reality, um, quite similar. Um, many of them share that they are um, truly good augmented reality editors, but they are not necessarily tailor-made for education and training. They lack um, some of the support functionality, some of the affordances that we require when we turn to learning. We are just about to publish a new um, report, a review of authoring tools functionality in support of learning where we um, conclude across um, the 900 or so screened works uh, that, we, uh, that we looked at and drilled down in our systematic literature review, of course, into a lower number of papers that we um, included. We found hardly any evidence uh, for any of the higher levels of Bloom. Um, as you can see here, most of the um, affordances supported by systems in the literature focus on, on the lowest level, remembering and understanding, some of them then going towards the direct application, but hardly anything going further in supporting learners in uh, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Yeah. 
it's clear that um, education often or educational applications often lag a little bit behind um, to what technologically is possible. Um, I shouldn't think so for our flagship technologies. Uh, on the contrary, sometimes think we're stretching the envelope. Um, but certainly with the big milestones we see here on the technological development, the first real smartphone um, where augmented reality then becomes possible with camera see-through and overlays and stuff like that. And the invention of the first serious consumer-grade smart glasses, um, something unlocks and um, we will see a lot more development in the space undoubtedly moving forward. Yeah, so um, lots of tools, not many made for education and training. And that's why we lifted off about seven, eight years ago, coming into a decade, yes, um, to build our own solution, which now in the third rewrite um, and the fifth or sixth research project surrounding it is now released as open source, um, which we call Mirage XR. Mirage XR um, has a, a vivid developer community of 28 members at the moment, um, actively releasing um, version 1.8 is about to come out um, with uh, a backend in, in Moodle. I'll speak about that in a second. And we, of course, would cordially invite you to check it out. And I will happily put a link in the chat where you can find the Moodle plugin, um, which we're waiting to get into the Moodle, Moodle um, plugin repository, as well as uh, the sources for the cross-platform application, which runs on, on mobiles, iOS and Android, and HoloLens 1 and HoloLens 2, and more platforms to come in the future. So a cordial invitation to try it out. Uh, we believe in it. We think we're on the right track here moving things forward towards um, reality as a platform for learning and teaching. The way it is conceptualized in our system is like that. We consider learning to take place in activities. Each activity consists of steps. Steps always have a task station, so a location of interest, and of course, um, a description of the step. And so that you don't get lost, there's always an aura surrounding you. If you look down, you will always find a floor line which takes you to where the action happens. In that space, then, we have different types of augmentations attached. They come from us, from a instructional design model. Um, we've modified for CID for that. Um, for CID, it consists of the four areas, uh, supportive information, um, part task practice, um, procedural information, and learning task. So there are different instructional design methods uh, for these four different sub areas. And um, in the predecessor project to Aret in Wikit, we already looked at a rich array of augmentations that support these areas. We have further extended this now to cover at the moment 14 types of augmentations from rather standard stuff like images, videos, and audio to more complicated things. Um, for example, we have an experience capture mode that um, captures what the expert does, asking them to uh, provide using a think aloud protocol uh, instruction like they would tell it to a trainee. So you walk through space, it records your torso and hand movement, and in the future at some point also define great finger movement and voice. And when press uh, stop recording, upload to the cloud, and uh, your learners get it, um, they will see a ghost of you in the room with them that explains how things work. Yeah, there are many other um, ones. I, I will also speak a little bit more about one of my favorites, and that's holographic artificial intelligences. Intelligent tutors, character models that like Siri or Alexa or Cortana you can talk to, but additionally, they can also show you things. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to talk in more detail about them, but I'll show you 
what this looks like. Here you see an example. This is in a, in a hospital space. Um, this here is a ghost recording of a expert providing some explanation about how to deal with a, um, a pediatric patient and um, explaining the drip pump as well as then in the next step using um, our visual language with overlays to direct attention to a specific spot here. So this is delivered on smart glasses. You have to imagine that you see this shimmering ring and fire in the room with you, but otherwise you see the real world unobstructed. And um, that's how on smart glasses, this is delivered on a mobile phone, of course. It's um, see the world through a window with a video feed, which then looks less shimmering and transparent and not as cool, I find, but nevertheless, a very professional. The way we have built our technology stack is uh, we have developed a combined uh, authoring and viewing tool, Mirage XR, which is available for four platforms iOS, Android, HoloLens 1, HoloLens 2, which are different hardware platforms. And this communicates with a repository plugin for Moodle, where the content produced is stored, can then be further edited in the web. So it's a much easier to quickly hack something in on a keyboard um, for the task card, for example, rather than, than having to type it on a holographic keyboard. And um, there is also then a, a learning analytics solution. Um, in our case, we use uh, a product from a small Oxford-based company, Learning Locker, which is, I think, the most popular um, solution in that field um, to collect uh, real-world interaction behavior traces. And at the moment, we're also working on the first assessment modules. We already have some and are extending that further. On the right-hand side, you see interfaces to 3D repositories like Sketchfab, which allow us to tap into um, resources available. Sketchfab has more than 4 million 3D models available, hundreds of thousands of them for free. There is something for anyone's taste, and it can also be used to upload stuff additionally. Behind the scenes, um, we have uh, started in 2015 to work on an augmented reality learning experience model for the IEEE Standard Association, which is now since 2020 a fully fledging standard. Behind the scenes, um, we use this activity description language and uh, we call it workplace description language. So the, the environment surrounding the user, the classroom, the home environment, uh, the work environment. Um, to deliver these um, learning experiences. So activity ML, the modeling language, describes step-step-step um, interaction and which augmentations can be brought up and how to link with them, how to talk to them. The workplace uh, modeling language then contains uh, info about how to recognize things, how, how a specific location can be detected, how uh, objects can be labeled with image target markers, or um, how to communicate with senders in case you want to take a direct reading from a machine that then alters the activity sequence and personalizes it. Things like that. <clears throat> we have, of course, um, a layered um, application which has grown quite complex over time. Um, there is increasingly more good documentation available supporting developers also in extending the technologies that we have here. Um, it is a service-oriented architecture, so some of these are then uh, stored in the cloud and uh, database access is um, secured so that we have a thin client application where the overlay and learning sequence is stored online and then downloaded and executed. So reality as a platform. Here, a bit more complicated um, this example. It's a guide to recording a high quality mm. um, from ECG, our nurses. Um, a skill that requires regular practice. Conduct a ECG, an electrocardiogram placement with these 12 lead electrodes. We've seen here the first step to um, calibrate the location, which allows us then to put up a hospital bed um, in the room of the student. Or if we remove the bed and tie it to a real hospital bed, then we can imagine 
indicating we have the best place to position the yourself patient, virtual relative model to the patient directly in a real bed. Well. At the foot of the bed, we literally where resources for this procedure so, yeah, that yeah. goes through the Including different stages. I think I'll jump procedure. in a little bit. So here we see a virtual patient. An ECG, which is a painless procedure for yeah. electrical activity. Meeting the patient, um, checking yeah, position, right. and then uh, doing a quiz, for example, on where the different electrodes need to be placed. So that's uh, relatively straightforward for wrist and ankles, unless you mix up left and right, except for my right or the patient right. It gets a bit more complicated than when we look at the joints, placement of the chest the electrodes, the um, where you have to count the crossing spaces, following here the instruction, and then um, here, testing you feel to the place, to the whether surfing. the placement is correct. So here, the one that's the first chest electrode is placed, and yeah, on the right side. And we can see that snaps in place that is correct, otherwise it will jump back. Yeah, that's um, just an example. On the right, you can see what the same application looks like on a mobile phone here on an iPad. And, yeah, that's, that's basically what we've been doing at the moment. We research a lot into um, holographic AIs. Well, we've just released the first feature of um, character models that we scan from real people or um, model. And that then can truly walk and talk to the user. So I'll give some space. Hi, I'm here, an intelligent virtual teacher. My work is to help you learn geometry, especially 3D and 2D shapes. You'll know how to identify different shapes and also understand their features. Are you ready? I am ready. What's your name? My name is Friedman. Let's jump Go over that icebreaker Free. activity and... <clears throat> well done. You can find that we are living in a three-dimensional world. Everything has height, width, and length, such as books, balls, and houses. 2D is different from 3D. 2D objects cannot be physically held, and they don't exist in our real life. But 3D shapes are tangible and also can be picked up. Now, the first geometry you need to learn is a cube. Look, I get a dice. Could you count how many faces it has? Six. That's it. Could you count how many edges? Yeah. And then it continues, continues a bit further. Um, it's powerful. It allows uh, users to explore if the dialogues are well structured, things in, in their own speed and with their own problems. It's an art, however, to design these dialogues. So we use a web-based tool for that where you develop a dialogue tree and uh, depending on how rigid or how flexible that dialogue is, it can guide people quite precisely to something where it allows more sort of a Siri, Alexa, Cortana-like open situation where you ask a question and then it takes it from there. Um, still a lot to be done um, to make them... Uh, Holographic AI is a little, little bit less uncanny. We also are experimenting with animated characters like an alien um, to see if that makes a difference and are going to investigate over the coming years also the role of trust and how that is influenced by all these different visual and other properties that we can manipulate. Appearance, behavior, intelligence, responsiveness, um, as you will see in, in one of our latest publications. It's in this one. Um, yes, so that's the stuff um, we're engaging with. So in a, in a quick run through still um, some of our findings, although of course this is ongoing work, we're just ahead of two big pilots, one for OpenReal within the Open University, where over the course of the next year, we investigate um, the impact of these technologies on student engagement, retention, and, and many other things. The other one um, with um, teachers in Aret, where we're looking at a significant number of teachers, as well as a second pilot um, in Italy um, with a significant number of students, um, primary school children. 
where we look at the bespoke build up based on our framework. And um, the, the stuff I'm going to present will, of course, um, grow and we will have more findings. We know, however, from um, the trials we conducted before with astronauts in, in space, and on the ground in replica module of the International Space Station and in a physical surface simulator of Mars, as well as with uh, maintenance engineers um, of airplanes, as well as with radiologists in training um, for, for medicine, that the general acceptance is very high. So if we pick one of the parts here from our space testbed, um, we can see, for example, um, the expectation regarding that facilitating conditions are must be there is, is high, um, that um, there are specific aspects here, yeah, PE, that's performance expectancy, that's from uh, Venkatesh's original model. Um, the expectation is high that it impacts on performance, um, on precision, and the other one is um, completeness, knowing when things are finished. That's in line with our findings from the European Space Agency Technology Roadmap that had similar expectations with regards to performance expectancy. But also, um, if we look at um, yeah, the effective quality, HM2B, for example, it has a very high effective quality. That's certainly the case because the medium is new. Smart glasses in particular are new. But then again, I think this is also something that will not necessarily wear off. That um, is just in the nature of augmented reality. So we're at the moment um, consolidating findings and are extending our prediction model for technology acceptance, which we call Tamara. There's one more publication missing coming soon before we apply it then in the next pilots. Um, with regards to yeah, the overall user interaction satisfaction. Um, we, just to pick a few, know that on, on these polarization scales, people consider technology to be wonderful, stimulating and easy, and um, generally still are on the, on the very positive side of this uh, polarization scales. We also looked into demographic effects and at the moment, can't find any. This may change. I hope not. It's an opportunity to get things right this time. Um, however, since the medium is particularly new, we did not find any differences between students and experts, male, female, young, old, um, degree of education. Um, the only difference we found was in the area of self-certified computer knowledge. Um, which made an impact, um, made a significant difference. So people who say they are very good at computers also will enjoy it more, whereas people who say they're particularly bad at computers will not necessarily enjoy it so much. But all other standard demographic effects that we've seen in the past for new technologies or not so new technologies then, um, like um, yeah, experts, uh, male and young um, performing better um, is certainly not the case right now. And that's a good thing. We will see how that changes over time and what can be done against creating such demographic effects. With regards to retention and memori memorability, um, it's, it's more tricky. So we, we do have positive findings, um, but not necessarily everywhere. The one where we saw it most was in the aviation test bed um, where, um, yeah, most of the questions uh, would be remembered better with the AR condition and the control group was only performing in one question uh, better. Um, if we level that out across all test bits, um, we had some surprising effects and that was not the ghost. We were expecting that the ghost would be a highly motivating thing um, that is fun to use. We were a bit surprised that uh, images in general um, had a negative effect on retention. And um, only in one test bit, a slightly positive one, it's probably down to the quality of the images. Um, that is something one can read 
from here, I'm sure. Yeah, well, for, for funsies, we also checked whether there is a problem with vertigo. Um, if there is any simulator sickness um, with smart glasses here, with augmented reality smart glasses, and we did not find any. The only difference we found on the HoloLens one was a bit of eye strain, which is not so surprising. The planes are relatively close. It has something to do with the Virgin's accommodation conflict. Um, it simulates perspective, but isn't really the same perspective. Um, so people reported a bit of eye strain and that um, yeah, may have even been improved now with the HoloLens 2, which has a, a more balanced design as well, the ability to fold it back and, and some things like that. Yeah. To summarize and conclude, the Pandemic has accelerated undoubtedly the trend towards technical education as the answer to increases in automation. Uh, jobs that can be done by a robot should be done by a robot, but somebody needs to invent and service that robot. Um, in, in a nutshell, maybe not, that's probably a bit too exaggerated. Um, the university is certainly more challenged than ever, in particular in the English-speaking countries um, with high study fees. That um, there are well, high study fees create room for alternative provision and um, people and companies are jumping into that field uh, as well as universities. We're expanding our apprenticeship program, for example, year after year. Um, there is certainly a big question in the room, what will happen with Meta, Microsoft, uh, IBM Academy, Google Grow, and whoever else, the multiverse, um, jumps into that space um, as rapid reskilling promises growth. There is space for innovation, for getting somewhere quicker with earlier productivity, less separation of learning and application context. Um, the metaverse is one of the technologies that are coming, that are disrupting everything, and that is an opportunity that we can, can grasp in the ed tech sector. So for XR learning in the real world, as I call it, um, we have already plenty of evidence, and that is also in line with what other studies find, that it can be used very beneficially. Uh, to relax constraints in space and time, and then, of course, associated cost savings as well. Um, it can increase engagement. It um, allows us to track performance in quite different ways, and that makes the separation of learning training context from application context less necessary, um, maybe. It certainly has a potential to completely disrupt teaching as we know it. Maybe in 10 years, we would meet in the metaverse rather than in a video conference call. Um, there are new approaches possible with wearable computing that have more to do with capturing what the expert does and then using AI to understand it, converting our ghosts to artificial intelligences that uh, can converse with the user is one of the goals, of course, that we have. And it, um, you yeah, know, can drastically reduce training downtime um, and learning downtime, especially where uh, travel to, to locations is required or not possible or only possible at the cost of safety. It provides certainly more autonomy to learning, teaching, training um, than we ever had. Um, just as an example, our colleagues uh, from Altex said um, a Mars mission is only possible with technologies like these because uh, other than for a moon mission, it would then take six years for people to train, making it basically unfeasible. Um, and uh, that requires a paradigm change in, in the way we produce things and in the way we learn rather to creating repositories where you get then life guidance when you need it, um, rather than practicing things a long time ahead. Yeah, that's um, 
that's it for me. Thank you uh, for for being here with me. I'm open to question. I think after the Q and A, and yeah, would like to finish with these two pointers. I think XR for learning is uh, an opportunity that can help us deliver a quality education at a cheaper price and can motivate a decent work and economic growth. Thanks. Thank you a lot, Fridolin, um, for your presentation on the exciting and, and mighty things you are doing and its global context. A lot of opportunities are unfolding in education and technology today, for sure. I'm sure that the audience is eager to get to the Q&A session to further expand on some of the topics that you have laid on the table. So now it's time for the second uh, presentation. Let me briefly introduce Pierre Bourdin by reading his short biography. Pierre graduated in computer science and robotics engineering. He has been teaching computer science in France for 10 years before moving to Barcelona to work as a researcher under the supervision of Mel Slater in the Event Lab at the University of Barcelona. He's now working as an associate professor in the multimedia team of the computer science department at the Open University of Catalonia. And he's responsible for the 3D programming, virtual reality and video games programming. His research considers the use of virtual reality and immersive technologies as tools to carry out research both at the technological level and at the psychological level, studying, for example, the behavior of people in virtual worlds, the contribution of immersive technologies in education, or health or e-health. It is a pleasure for me to give the floor to Professor Pierre Bourdin. So, Pierre, it's your time. Yes. Thank you for the, the introduction. I think everything is, is you said everything perfectly. So I'm trying to share my screen. I think it should work. So um, thank you for, for in, inviting me. Um, I will uh, do a, a, a short presentation and, and also uh, a little bit more, uh, maybe uh, do it yourself than, than the, the amazing project that, that Fridolin has shown us. Uh, first, I will talk about uh, a little bit what I call uh, the XR technologies and the differences I see uh, between these different technologies. Uh, a very short part about the evolution and the, the characteristics, and then uh, some application in education, uh, some ideas and, and, and some uh, project that we are running now, and, and the challenges. And, and the conclusion that will not be very different from the one of Fridolin. So to begin with, uh, I think it's important to define what we call uh, immersive technologies. The, I mean, uh, technologies that are trying to emulate the physical world from a uh, digital or simulated world. And, and this is creating the sensation of immersion that uh, embodies us inside the, the application. Uh, I think this is something that is common to all the, the medium, uh, even uh, if you are uh, on a very, I would say, small, um, maybe a screen of a mobile phone. If there is something in the virtual world that happened in this uh, screen, you are uh, immersed inside the, the screen and you forget everything around you. So that, that's uh, how that, that works. Uh, the difference uh, are important. They are uh, different technology. As, as we've seen, there is this continuum. And so in this continuum, there is the augmented reality on one side and the virtual reality on the other side. So uh, in the augmented reality, we have the, the reality and we add some information on top of it. And usually, in, especially in education, it has been a, a little bit more used because it was uh, a little bit less expensive when uh, the smartphone have been available commonly. So it was uh, quite current to, to, to do some work with uh, augmented reality. Uh, virtual reality at the very beginning was uh, reserved to big company or, or big laboratories because it was requiring a lot of technology uh, or, or very expensive uh, helmet or, or these kind of things. But this has changed. And there is, uh, as, as Fredolin has, has explained, there is like a, 
a mixture now between those technology and the difference is not so evident anymore. Um, and you have like HoloLens, which is a helmet which is offering augmented reality, and and you can uh, probably uh, see uh, less and less difference between between uh, the different the, the two difference. And and the last one is the video G sixty. So they are videos where you are at a fixed point, but you, you can look all around in 360 uh, degrees. So it's it's a bit different, but it has also been used quite a lot because it was uh, easier on the technology. You, you just had to uh, record the video and then you could display the video and it was... Uh, Already offering some some freedom to the to the viewer of the video in the sense that he could choose the direction where he wants to look, but it's a bit different in the sense that you you can't uh, modify the video. What is register is already register, and you can only change the point of view, but not the place where it has been uh, recorded. So uh, another point I would like to record uh, to the audience is that uh, also we are uh, thinking sometimes that this is something new. Actually, it started in the 60s. Uh, and I like uh, to to remember this this uh, sensorama machine from, from uh, Morton uh, Eyelids, which was uh, a simulation of, of uh, traveling with a motorbike. And it was uh, really uh, immersive and really multisensory. Uh, as you see on on the on the seat, uh, there was there were some vibration to simulate uh, that the people were traveling with the moto. You had also some smell of the of the, the gasoline and things, and and you could see in the in the video in the in the screen on the screen you could see the recorded uh, movie of the the track that has been. Uh, uh, done with the motorbike. So since that time, of course, things have, have uh, changed a lot. And uh, I think one of the, the key points was 2010 with the release of, of affordable uh, HMDs no? and helmets that uh, changed a little bit the done. Before that, virtual reality was uh, reserved to uh, big companies or big universities because it was requiring a lot of of uh, investment for the technology. But uh, nowadays, the, the technology is less and less a problem and it's, and it's improving and the price is also uh, decreasing. So it's more affordable. In, in education, uh, there are different motivation and, and I think uh, the previous presentation explained it quite well. For example, you can use it uh, to do some time travel. You can do things that are uh, not uh, possible, like you can explore uh, other planets, or you can also avoid dangerous situation. Uh, it is also very interesting for an uh, uh, ethical reason. For example, when you when you think of students learning surgery, instead of working with, with cadaver, they can work with a simulation. And uh, many studies have shown that it's it's uh, not the same, but it's giving uh, very good results. And so it's much better if you can train on, on a, a mechanical system with, a, with an artificial simulation than working on, on cadaver. Uh, other advantages of a traditional method are that it can uh, transform the abstract into tangi tangible. No? So you can you can have something abstract and you can represent it in the virtual world and you can make it uh, easier to understand because you can figure it. And, and sometimes even you can manipulate it. And this is something very important. I think that uh, the other medium for learning uh, not necessarily have. Uh, you can uh, learn by doing instead of just observing. And of course, I think it is, uh, a complementary method. It is not maybe uh, to uh, necessary to substitute all everything or to think uh, how to substitute everything with uh, these these technologies. But I think they can complement and they can uh, give a lot of of uh, new opportunities for students. 
For example, uh, it is very interesting when you have a desirable uh, situation, but concretely that you can't achieve. Like if you want to travel with a classroom uh, with pupils, for example, let's say, in many different points, uh, like, let's say, I don't know, in Greece, in Germany, in Romania, or in, in Mexico, you couldn't do that. Uh, but using the virtual reality, you can, in a way, transport all the pupils in the same place and visit, I would say, in the same time, almost the different places and, and, and have a visit of these different uh, uh, point of interest. Also, it can be interesting uh, to break the boundaries of the reality. For example, you can define a, a, a virtual world with different uh, law of physics, and you can even in real time manipulate this law of physics and see the results. So it's again, uh, learning by doing in the sense that you can uh, manipulate the, the law of physics and see the, 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 the results in real time. It has also been uh, demonstrated by many authors that uh, it helps the students to develop their creativity and, and innovation. So I think it's very interesting when, when not only because you, you, uh, you have this, this uh, gadget effect, I would say, or this uh, war effect that, that you have a new technology and you bring it to, to, to the classroom and, and uh, the students are uh, interested because, because it's new. But also uh, many students have, have shown that uh, it's really uh, increasing the creativity and, and the innovation. By doing this, you, 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 you help the student to, to be more creative. It has been also uh, very interesting to have a safe and simulated environment. And it, it shows that uh, when the, the learner is in a safe situation, he decreases his anxiety and this improves the learning and, and encourages the, the collaboration. So uh, in that sense, it's, it's very interesting. It is also uh, used uh, to visualize the data that are complex or to help making uh, decision if it's uh, decision making in a more efficient way. Uh, for example, there are applications uh, in, in medicines when uh, you have to learn how to um, give bad uh, news to, uh, for example, to a patient and this is, or to his family. And this is a situation which is quite complex and, and uh, difficult to learn. Uh, most of the time in nursing school or, or in uh, physician school, they don't learn it and you have to learn it uh, facing the, the, the patient and, and, and trying on your own to, to, to explain them uh, the, the bad situation they are, they are facing. So by doing a simulation, you, you, can, you can learn with a, a virtual agent like we've seen in the simulation of, of the previous presentation, how to, to deal with this situation. And this is uh, very interesting. Uh, another point that is uh, interesting is that it, it can help to put yourself in the shoes of, of someone else. So you can uh, suddenly become a girl, you can become a guy, you can uh, become uh, also a racialized person. And so you can understand the, 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 the world from another point of view. And this is something uh, other technologies uh, can't offer in the same way. So this works very well if you use especially a technology that is called embodiment, where you have an avatar and you uh, control this avatar and you see this avatar from the first person perspective. So when you move, you see the avatar moving and, and, and you feel that you, you become this, this uh, character, this avatar. Also, it's virtual. Also, it doesn't look uh, really human. It doesn't really uh, change anything. Your, your brain is, is uh, treating this character as your new body. And, and then uh, you can start uh, running uh, experiments or, or uh, learning actions. So this is very interesting, for example, to, to prepare future teachers to manage a difficult situation like bullying or a, a meeting with parents uh, in, in the same way as, as the medical doctor uh, we said before. But it can also help a lot for doing role-playing activities 
like it's necessary for psychology students or also for law students. For example, um, if you want to become an advocate, maybe uh, you have to to learn uh, how to be uh, the judge, how to be uh, the I don't know the the the, the defense lawyer or uh, the accusation, and so you can play the different role and you can switch from them and and learn from that. So I will show you um, something different, uh, something uh, that we've done uh, for uh, students who want to learn uh, by distance uh, space design. So it is an application uh, and uh, concretely, it's a, a short video where we, we were explaining the virtual environment to the architects who were uh, teaching the, the, the classroom. This last two. So you can see that uh, the person is wearing the helmet and entering into the virtual world. And so or she she can uh, manipulate and design the, the world. She can add some some uh, furniture or so, some decoration element like this, this plant. And she can uh, manipulate and control the, the whole uh, environment. So that, that was the idea. The idea was to have this... Um, this virtual environment and to teach the students how to design the environment uh, depending on the function of the of uh, the environment. For example, if you want to do a co-working space or if you want to do an hostel, you wouldn't uh, design in the same way. An interesting feature is that uh, you we implemented a virtual camera so you could uh, organize the, the, the virtual space and take picture of the virtual space and, and include it in the reports you have to send to the teacher. So it was pretty much the same situation as if you, if you would be in the in the real place and would uh, reorganize or, or, or redesign the place. Another uh, very interesting feature is that you can manipulate the environment and control, for example, uh, the day of the light or uh, the light of the day or, or the time, the temperature, so you can see the effect uh, of the different lightings uh, during the different uh, period of the day. Uh, Sorry. So another uh, example that I wanted to show you is, is a pilot that we are uh, developing um, right now for teaching uh, photography and, and video. So um, the idea is to have uh, a metaphor where we use the mobile phone as the, as the camera and we want to have uh, this augmented reality application where the students can manipulate their mobile phone uh, as the camera uh, inside the, the, the augmented uh, virtual environment. The idea is by using this to encourage the student to act and experiment uh, and, and having this, this uh, freedom of action. And the specificities of the project is that the teaching uh, is done only remotely and the activity have to be uh, asynchronous. So I have also a very short video that I will comment of the, the application. So we have different, uh, the idea is to learn the different plans that you can have with a camera and we have implemented different mode like a free mode, sequential or interrogative where you can see uh, the, the different uh, axes, the different uh, plan with the, the camera. So if we go for one mode, so you've seen briefly the marker that, that is on the table, and then uh, you have uh, the virtual environment that appear and manipulating the camera, you have to go uh, on the indicated plan. So for example, it says, uh, go to the Picado plan. Uh, I don't know the, the English way of, of it, but uh, it's uh, from the top, I would say. So uh, you have to go in this, in, in, you have to, uh, oriented your, your uh, mobile phone to be on this uh, precise uh, position. And then the application give you, give you feedback. So you can change the, uh, so for example, here it says front art, so you have to be in, in front of the, of the application, of the, of the character, and, and the application is giving you some, some feedback. Well, I think you basically you understood the, the 
how it works. What interested me in this and that what I wanted to to uh, tell you is the difficulties we we've been facing during this uh, the development of this prototype, and particularly. Uh, how taking ownership of the technology has been difficult. What could be done, what cannot be done, and how to design the activities without knowing the technology is, is complicated. It's very difficult for the teacher to, to develop an activity when you don't know the limit of the technology. I will give you an example. For example, you can have... Um, at the very beginning, what the teacher wanted was to manipulate the lights. So uh, he was uh, preparing some exercises where there were different lights, and uh, like projectors or, or uh, photographic lights, and to see the influence of the lights on the shadow of the different characters and how this could influence the scene and make it more uh, sharp or, or um, more uh, soft. But the problem is that uh, with the technology, we have actually uh, only a few mobile phones are able to manipulate the, the, the light in a decent way. And also, if you have more than, than two lights, probably the system uh, does not work uh, very well anymore because it's too, uh, it's too, too complicated to, for the, the system to... Uh, to calculate all these lights. So we had to redo all the exercises and, and forget about this. And moreover, it's not only the technological problem, but also the way of thinking that has to be changed. For example, this teacher this, this is a specialist of video and is very good in, in, that, in that sense, but he's thinking in video mode, what I call video mode. What, I mean, in a, in a timeline, which is sequential, and is planning the action sequentially. And when you have this uh, augmented reality application where the students have the freedom and the application, you know, the different actions are not sequentially organized, it's completely disconcerting for him. And, and he, it's, it's difficult for him to think about activities that are not sequentially organized. So it's, it's not only the technology, but a little bit more, and, and it needs to, the people to get used to, to this new way of thinking. In that sense, the dialogue between the technological part and the, and the teaching part is really the keystone. It's really important. And also it's important to have very short uh, cycle and to, to have constant exchanges between, between the people. Otherwise, it's very complicated. So the challenges in the future, I think uh, my colleague already uh, explained this uh, very well. The software and the hardware costs are, are um, in, improving a lot. I think uh, both parts are really uh, uh, now affordable. And, and I think you can, you can find very interesting uh, software and hardware uh, available and, and it will uh, uh, for sure, it, it it will continue on this on this way. The logistic and the scalability is also, uh, I think, uh, something that is uh, almost uh, solved. In our case, where the teaching is is hundred percent online, for example, we need to have the students to have uh, um, some material that is uh, sufficiently powerful to 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 execute the the augmented reality or virtual reality application. And at the beginning, it was really a problem, and now it's becoming less and less a problem. The accessibility and the dizziness, I think, also these problems are are almost solved. They are um, improving a lot. The scientific validation is is uh, also something that is uh, proven already, but I think it misses uh, long-term engagement and, and a demonstration of the long-term effect. And I think still the investigation is at an early stage. There, they've been, as I said, I mean, this is something that is studied since the 50s, but uh, still we are in an early stage in the sense that we need more research, especially to define what should uh, um, immersive technology be applied or not? Uh, I don't think everything is, is good to be done with uh, these technologies. What are the contribution, the costs, the limitation, and 
also some studies, especially in learning and e-learning, that goes beyond the, the what I call the woe effect or the gadget side, uh, where you you do a comparison between uh, control where uh, students have to do uh, traditional mathematics and some uh, other um, uh, modality where they use uh, exciting uh, new uh, uh, helmet or, or virtual reality or augmented reality stuff. And, and of course, there is more engagement and there is uh, more attractivity for the, the, the part with the technology with this, this material and, and the technology. So uh, to conclude, I, I say that, I would say that uh, it's really uh, a promising tool that these technologies are really promising and, and, and they, they offer almost an infinity of possible application. I think there is still a lot to explore, especially in the field of e-learning. I believe that this is something that, uh, as my colleague said, probably in the next 10 years, we will see a big differences uh, coming and a lot of people will, will probably uh, be teaching in the metaverse. Um, I think it is very valuable to enrich the learning uh, experiences. I think we should not think of it as something to replace the way we are teaching now, but a, a way of enriching and, and adding a new dimension to, to this learning. And also, I would like to, to recall that the ethical aspect are very important and should not be neglected, especially uh, when you think of this metaverse and, and all of this uh, new virtual uh, world that are connected uh, and where people will interact together. Uh, this uh, will probably raise, uh, I mean, this already raised uh, ethical issues that, that we have to think about. And, and as uh, academics, we have to, to, to study. Uh, I just would like to, to remind you that when you live a virtual experience or an experience in the virtual world, this experience is real. I mean, if you uh, someone, if you have like a bad experience in the virtual world, also, it's virtual, it affects you and it can affect you badly. So we have to think really and, and, and consider these ethical aspects uh, as something very important. And the last point is that the technology is ready. I think it's the moment. So if you, if you want to, 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 to do more with virtual reality or, or augmented reality, well, jump on it and, 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 and take your chance. That's really the, the, the good moment. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me, and and uh, I'm available to answer your question if you have some question. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for such an interesting and exciting presentation. It is wonderful work you and Fridolin are doing to introduce XR for teaching and learning in higher education, despite all the challenges and and, and difficulties that you are opening the uh, the path. I would like now to give the floor to Gise for the Q&A session, because I think that we have some uh, some questions in the chat. So please, Gise. Yeah, hello, everyone. So in this last part of the session, the speaker will address all your questions, and I already gathered a few of them. So first question to Fridling. Um, thank you, Professor Weil. Please, do you have experience as well with dynamic manufacturing process AR computer simulation? Um, yes, so yeah. of course, uh, adaptive manufacturing is one of the areas where I personally think AR guidance makes most sense. So adaptive manufacturing where you have a production line that allows you to configure the product that comes out of it at the end um, in, in many ways. Um, in surprising ways, BMW here in Oxford, for example, I think they allow for a million different configurations of their mini and every mini that comes out of the end of the production line, which is like every 68 seconds, um, is different. So in particular for some of the more complicated uh, tasks where um, Errors can easily slip in. I think there's additionally also potential for validation, for quality assurance. So I think that's the perfect tool for adaptive manufacturing and couldn't, couldn't imagine how we 
can get more performance gains without AR learning, training, and guidance. Fantastic. So I have a question for Pierre in this case. So um, aside from experience in virtual reality for space design, could you talk about your involvement using XR resources in education? I think you mentioned a little bit about this, but if you can mention other examples that you didn't say already. Uh, well, I don't know what what in in what field, for example, you you would like. Or uh, I think there are uh, so many different uh, possibilities. Uh, my uh, own experience is is. Uh, I think with this, uh, for example, for the, this uh, architecture or uh, interior design uh, application that, that we developed, uh, one exciting point of it is that you can make uh, the invisible visible. We've been working for the health of the building, for example. So how the different components can affect the, the health of of the people that are living inside the environment. And uh, one interesting thing is that you can uh, visualize the different, uh, for example, a magnetic field that are uh, present in, in a room. So depending on the electric uh, facilities or uh, the Wi-Fi, the different um, electric electric or electromagnetic fields so you can make a representation of them and you and you can uh, in that sense that can help to organize uh, the the space and and something is knowing it something is visualizing it inside the virtual world so you you wear the the, the glasses and you enter the world and you switch on uh, uh, the, the visualization of this uh, electromagnetic field and it just become clear where you want to put a chair and where you don't want to put a chair. So this, I think this is uh, interesting in that sense that you can uh, visualize what is normally uh, invisible. Terrific, thank you. So another one for Professor Freeling. Um, has holographic artificial intelligence been tested and implemented already as learning resource? Yeah, and in our Mirage XR, we've just released it, so it's possible to use it directly there. Um, evaluations are in, in planning stage, so we have done already a few things. We're particularly interested in the element of trust that people develop towards holographic AIs, and um, that learning is the perfect application for that. Um, what else can you think of where, where trust is as necessary as that? We did some pre-tests and fine-tuned the new metric scale that we're proposing for that. And the next step for us is now to, to go out and, and test it with um, real end users. Yeah. So we did a preliminary evaluation also in healthcare, um, which was insightful. We had a holographic AI that was a rehabilitation trainer teaching um, post-cancer surgery survivors how to do exercises. So we had motion captured a good set of standard exercises for different conditions and worked with medical people and sports scientists um, in a decision tree that helps select the right exercise. And um, there was a success but yeah, also showed that there's still a lot of work to be done in the area. Yeah, so bit by bit. And there are a few studies out there that go in that direction, but it is um, a very cutting edge field with still a lot of work to be done. Lovely. Well, regarding uh, future steps, uh, th there's another question for you. Professor Weil says, regarding the rapid rescaling with AR, what are the steps you are planning to take in the short term? The, the last part was, what are the steps we are? What are the, um, okay. What are the steps you're planning to take in the short term? The steps we're planning to take in the short term. Um, so for us, I think, one of the key motivations for this work is that content is still the biggest shortcoming in the field. 
and I think everybody here on the panel, I see nodding. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, whenever whoever you ask, whichever review you look at, um, it's uh, content is the problem. Content is the problem. So that's why we invested so much time also into an authoring tool. Um, and uh, our rationale there is if we can make the creation of XR learning easier so that any teacher can, can do it in kind of one-to-one -one time, the time it would take to create something in real in a lesson. Uh, if we can capture that and make it accessible as an engaging experience in augmented reality in the same amount of time-ish, then um, we should be able to produce content quickly and therefore roll out rapid reskilling to any area. And that's certainly a, a big challenge because yeah, we know garbage in, garbage out. Um, good teachers don't fall from the sky. And it takes also some practice to get the nicks and knacks of a medium. But that's the goal, to make this easier. And we're investing a lot at the moment into new types of learning designs. Um, the roadmap there is towards March, April next year. We want to have some more advances for learning design support templates um, and configurable activities where you already have an activity set up and then you fill it with flesh as a teacher. So it, it tells you which parts you need to create and which parts then should be user generated. Um, that's one of the things we do. And at the same time, we've just rewritten our tutorial manager so that we can teach people skills in production more easily so that you can have a special session on how to use character models, for example. But overall, yeah, I think that's the main angle that we need to take. Make enable teachers more easily to create content. Get away from the geek corner of um, the, the yeah, kind of Photoshop class of, of people. Not everybody has that skills to edit on that level. We want stuff that everybody can use. Lovely. I think Luis has a couple of questions. Yes, thank you, Yise. Uh, I wanted to, to lay on the table a thing that did say that almost every month we see new initiatives from private companies regarding XR in many fields, sometimes in education also. And at the same time, we see public institutions uh, which are pushing forward research initiatives to increase the knowledge base around this matter. Which is the role uh, you think that public sector uh, should adopt regarding this and the different agents involved in uh, education? It's an open question for both the speakers you tap into one of my favorites. I think um, education could be the enabler. I think we, we always curse about the role of earlier infrastructure support programs. Like I remember um, in Bavaria, when I lived there, I grew up in, in Bavaria from, from the South. Um, we had a program called Schools to the Data Highway. And it was rolled out. It basically gave fast uh, internet access to schools and that was it and we complain a lot about the lack of instruments tools pedagogical support uh, that it's just infrastructure thrown at, at people but i think at the same time that's exactly what we need for xr and an investment by the public hand would make a difference if you look around in the US, for example, the military has just decided to renew its contract with Microsoft for purchases of the HoloLens, which equates to the sum that they cited for the worth of the contract, equates to giving, I did calculate that for a different talk, um, it was something like a dozen or more devices per American school. So for the same amount, you could have fitted every school with enough devices to have a full classroom enabled. Like um, 30 years ago, computer-assisted language learning labs, uh, like um, 20 years ago, uh, fast bandwidth rooms uh, for uh, video conferencing. Remember when we had to go to a special room? Um, we can do this with smart glasses. Why, why aren't we doing this? Um, we, we can make this massive infrastructure investment and push the whole sector forward we can help create a market. And currently there is not yet a market for smart glasses. 
And if we do it right, we will do it with the right pedagogy skill support, with the right tools, with the right teaching strategies, learning designs, and everything. We, we, we can do this in a good way. Well, I agree. I think it's it's really also important to have uh, support from the, the the public institution. Like I remember, uh, twenty years ago, maybe uh, I was working on a European project with Eurocopter, and they, they had this uh, new uh, tool that was a blackboard with a projector, and you could virtually draw. Uh, on top of the on the real blackboard and this was amazing at that time and I think now it's something that is quite common to find in, in some of the schools uh, ordinary schools for, for uh, everyone in Europe so I believe there is always a gap and a time between uh, what is uh, available uh, in for the research or for the big companies, and and then the time to 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 for the technology to become available. I think we are uh, at that time, and I think it's important to 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 continue the support uh, of the research and, and of the, the the company that are uh, innovating, so that we can develop these new technologies and we can we can expand them and we can make them available. Um, I think also, uh, if, if I, if I uh, remember well, uh, one of the very first uh, proof of the efficiency of, of virtual technologies in education was in, in, uh, in medicine, where a surgeon were uh, teach to do uh, minimally invasive uh, training. And at the beginning, this was quite expensive. And now uh, I will be in the tribunal of a thesis from a, a surgeon from Colombia uh, next week, who designed a very uh, inexpensive system, which is working very well, and he proved that uh, it can be used as well as the very expensive one. So it's it's something that that helps, uh, and and it's not necessarily very expensive. It, 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 doesn't have to be something big and something expensive. It, it can be also very efficient and, and very affordable. A la paradoscopic simulator, I, I believe, Pierre, yeah, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I also know that project. It's really exciting. I also wanted to, um, to ask you both about um, one of the things that we have um, that we have drawn during the session, which is um, which are the most promising lines uh, for XR in education for the following five years? Uh, Fridolin has also mentioned, has already mentioned that content is a pain in the neck for the sector and authoring tools should be uh, one of the um, enablers in this sense. But um, which are the lines that you see that are um, getting more mature in, in XR education in the following five years? If we take the right uh, research funding uh, forward, then certainly I think in, in that area of the flipped classroom where we can transgress who is there, who is not there, hybrid meetings, who is, who is coming in, that, that situation that uh, the, the big companies are depicting for our private and work life, um, that, that we dial in, that we have an avatar representation, that we um, can get a recording of a teacher, explain us something, that we have a holographic AI to converse with, and um, that we have a hybrid uh, classroom, part uh, offline, part home, part in the school. I think that would make a big difference, the flipped classroom, as I call it. So I have a couple of questions from the audience. Well, another one. Okay. Um, is that, I believe this is for, for Fridolin, but it's not quite sure for me if Pierre also can ask this question. Is the distant learning curriculums that we that were discussed are available in cloud to access? Yeah, so our stuff is um, in the cloud, if you want. So, um, we also have a small spin-out company that can fit you with your own servers, uh, booting them up in the cloud. It's called Wicked X, Experience Capturing and Services. Um, that's possible, and uh, the, at the OU, we're pushing a lot towards uh, 
creation of open educational resources around it for, for XR so that we release um, some stuff for free and for everyone to just further the field and kickstart this development. So there is a test server that we currently maintain as well that we can hook you up with from the Arete project. There are, there are some possibilities. Lovely. I have a question for Pierre. Um, I hope I read it well. What is the estimated ROI, ROI for the AR distance learning curriculum? For example, for the photography um, um, resource that you present. It's, it's difficult to say because it's dep it depends a lot of the, of the context. Uh, in this um, in this case, uh, we we are going to present the, the, the pilot of the application uh, in December to the students. So I will tell you uh, if everything goes well uh, a little bit further. In other uh, projects, uh, it's it's interesting, but of course, at the beginning, the the, the investment is still uh, maybe something uh, more important. So uh, it's it's. Uh, something which is, uh, I think, you should, if you want to to plan a project, you you should uh, think of of investment in the in the material and the software and 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 the 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 benefits will come further. Uh, that's also uh, what is difficult to to evaluate. Uh, in the long term, I think that's why I'm, I'm saying we need more studies in the field where, uh, with with long term evaluation of of uh, the, the the different application or the different modalities that are offered to the students, and and that's uh, precisely what we are doing actually with this this pilot. Okay, so I think we are taking the last two questions because we are running way out of time. Uh, this is for uh, for both the speaker and for Luis. It says, would it be possible to mention some already available simulation for online class classroom teaching? Uh, well, in my case, I, I don't have uh, any available uh, online uh, like resource that, that I could uh, recommend that is freely available or something. Uh, I don't know if Freedom in us has maybe some some sample. Yes, yeah, so the there's plenty of stuff out there. Um, just check the stores. So there, there are bespoke applications um, in in many areas, um, yeah, both in virtual reality as well as in augmented reality. It's, it's more and more stuff available. Um, you just have to look through the stores or there are also some lists floating around of people promoting educational material. Just to mention some of them, I would mention uh, Class Edu, for example, which is a tool that it's already been used in primary schools here in Spain. And also the use of um, generic um, spaces or workspaces that are being used to conduct uh, classes like uh, Horizon workspaces or the space application, which allow different people to share a common space and then carry on different kinds of activities. And one of these activities that are being carried out are uh, educational activities. So this would be some some of the many that are available right now and that are really being used. Okay, so the last question is a pretty long one and it for, is for all the speakers. Have you considered that this kind of apps which shows, show us an immediate reality, virtual reality, could limit some of our abilities such as imagine or visualize when they can show immediately as whatever we could imagine? I think this is a pretty long question, and I see you're replying. No, I, I think I, it's 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 quite easy to answer. I say uh, uh, in the sense that it's a bit like uh, using a mobile phone. Uh, when when you at the beginning when you were using a mobile phone, and I still know some people that don't want to use a smartphone because they say that uh, 
the, the, it's uh, damaging their uh, their memory that they don't if they are using the mobile phone they don't remember the number of their mother and and that they used to know or this kind of thing so of course I mean this is something that that uh, happened and and that's why it's also important to to uh, follow uh, the the studies and the academic work on this sense uh, because of course being in this virtual world. It has some side effects, and and as uh, I don't know, using uh, Google Maps also has some side effect, and that maybe you cannot uh, find uh, a place in a new city that you don't know if you don't have the the Google Map working. Well, maybe we will have some 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 side effect like this, and this is an interesting question. But I don't think it's really a risk, and as I said, I think it's it should be. Uh, sort of complementary activities, especially for learning, not not probably not to replace uh, at the time, uh, for sure not, uh, all the activity we are doing for teaching. And if I may add, I think I, I truly believe it has a lot to do with the activity design. So you can design things uh, very visual, very unimaginative, but um, you can do this also differently. I've seen uh, someone develop a augmented reality learning activity for time management um, two days ago, where you think like, how the heck would you do that? It's nothing visual. It's, it's really a question of the activity design and thinking of situations where you motivate creativity. It's uh, a question of the instruction, not a question of the medium. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you both. And I think that uh, we, we mentioned that before, I think, uh, and it should go in the direction of providing authentic experiences in fields where without this technology, we will not be, or we are not able to provide uh, these authentic experiences because of uh, they are implying high costs or high risks for the health of the people. So it should go in the uh, complementary sense that, that uh, Pierre just said, uh, in order to provide authentic and vivential experiences in those situations in which it is difficult to teach or to learn um, for these for these sectors. So it should go uh, that way, I think. Are there any other questions, Gise, in the chat? No, that was the last one. So perfect. Okay. So, so just to conclude, uh, since we are running out of time, as Gise said, uh, I have to say that I'm really happy of being part of this terrific webinar. We have had the opportunity to get to know how extended reality is currently being used in education and some uh, and in some other fields also, with many initiatives exploring the pedagogical effect of these experiences and the different roles involved in uh, education, in the educational world. Uh, we have underlined also that content is a challenge right now for, for, the, um, for the field. And thus, authoring tools seem like a good way to overcome this bottleneck, taking into consideration also affordance and accessibility. If we are able to provide authoring tools to um, as many people as possible, we will be able to produce a lot of content and reuse this content for educational purposes. We already have uh, we have already talked about the solid research uh, background we have already, but that it clearly needs to to be further developed in terms of long term results and also ethical implications among others. And we have also talked about a little bit on the role of public sector in relation to the many private initiatives that are disrupting the XR uh, and education world. So um, I think that we have reached the end of this seminar, which, um, in my opinion, has been very uh, enriching. And last thing would be to thank to thank Iden, to thank Gise for the organization for the Q and A session, and our two speakers, uh, Friedelin and Pierre, for such uh, nice uh, talks. I think it has been uh, really, really enriching. So. Thank you, everyone, and stay tuned for next webinars on these and other interesting topics. Good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye for now.